Hello, and uh, welcome to my talk about uh, syscall supervision. Uh, my name is Christian Browner. I uh, am one of the Lexi maintainers um, and project leads for Lexi and Lexi together with Stefan. Um, and I'm also a kernel engineer working on the upstream kernel in a, a variety of fields. Um, and today I'm going to talk a bit about a work, uh, a bit of work we've done over the last couple of years um, to make containers more usable. Um, and, and it's a very interesting piece of work that uh, has to do with intercepting and emulating um, syscalls in user space. Um, so first of all, this is the rough outline of this talk. Um, I think we're going to start, I'm going to start reintroducing the concept of uh, unprivileged containers because this is usually something that people don't have a um, clear grasp on, even though they have been uh, around for quite a while, and in general, a good idea to uh, keep everyone on the same page. Um, then I'm going to briefly talk a bit about uh, syscalls, um, but uh, I won't be going uh, too deep into it, so um, don't worry. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, syscall interception so uh, and syscall emulation. And then I'm going to give a brief demo of uh, this feature. So what are containers? So first of all, the dictum that most people uh, are familiar with at this point in time is that containers are a user space fiction. So they don't really exist, meaning the Linux kernel doesn't really have a concept of what a container um, actually is. It's sort of more you take a bunch of different kernel interfaces um, and you can combine them in different ways, namespaces, C groups, um, LSM, seccomp, and then at some point you end up with something that you can call a container. Um, but we can classify them um, in roughly in two distinct types. Um, main types that are of interest to this talk at least. So first of all, privileged containers and uh, then unprivileged containers. So uh, privileged containers are essentially containers in which UID zero inside of the container is identical to UID zero um, on the host. So UID zero in the container is actually a real root on the host. It also means that any container breakout that happens from a privileged container uh, onto the host is immediately pretty severe, so it's going to be a big problem. Um, and the other type is unprivileged containers, um, and it's the other way around. So UID zero in the container is not UID zero on the host. So it means if you, so you're not real root, and if you escape, uh, if you escape um, such a container and you have set it up correctly, then you will have the exact same privileges as any user uh, on the host. Um, so there's a big security boundary here. Um, and this security boundary is uh, enforced by uh, user namespaces. They are what make unprivileged containers actually uh, possible. So user namespaces in, of it, in itself, they are kind of complex, um, but they are a pretty powerful security mechanism that should be used everywhere instead of privileged containers. So in the simple explanation is they allow you to, to define mappings between uh, UIDs and GIDs. So let's say you're inside of a container and uh, you're looking at your own user ID, then you see that you will be running as, that you will have UID zero, for example, or UID 1000. So everything looks normal from inside the container. But if you look at this uh, container from the outside and suddenly you will see uh, usually you see uh, UID in a very high range. So even though your uh, UID zero inside the container, if you look at it from the host, your UID 100,000, which kind of feels weird. Um, so, and this is done by these UID and GID mappings. So basically you're telling the kernel, I want UID zero from inside the container to correspond to UID 100,000 on the host, such that when UID zero breaks out of the container, it will, have the exact same privileges as UID 100,000 will have um, on the container. Um, so this is the whole security mechanism, uh, or this is one of the core concepts uh, of the security mechanism 
of the username space security mechanism. We, for example, if you define a mapping like 0, 100,000, and the range is 1,000, that means you map UID 0 inside of the container to UID 100,000 on the host. You map uh, UID 1 uh, inside of the container to UID 100,001 100, uh, on the host, and so on. Um, and the container sees UAD zero and the host sees UAD 100,000. And um, this is mainly what it's all about. Um, so before we go on to the next slide, um, username spaces not just isolate uh, on, do not just concern themselves with UAD and GAD mappings. They also isolate uh, capabilities, which is another security mechanism uh, in the Linux kernel. Um, so instead of, uh, asking, so when I'm asking, do I have a given capability? I'm usually asking, do I have a given capability in my current user namespace? And so, for example, a range of capabilities, uh, but some capabilities will be checked against um, the initial user namespace or the host user namespace, um, and can, such that a container can never uh, have these capabilities uh, on the on the host. And this brings us to the limitations of uh, unprivileged containers. Uh, there are quite a lot, um, and there are quite a few obvious ones. So first of all, um, it can't. They usually can't mount block devices, and they usually also they can't mount block devices, and they can't create any device nodes. Um, and this, especially the device nodes, uh, have something to do with what I mentioned before, capabilities for creating. So if I want to create a device node, the kernel will check whether I have the capability to create device nodes. But instead of asking, do I have this capability in my current user namespace, it will ask, do I have this capability in the initial user namespace to prevent unprivileged containers from creating device nodes? Because creating arbitrary device nodes as well as uh, arbitrary block devices can be used to actually attack the host. And that's something which you want to avoid. Uh, avoid. Think about creating def mem or def k mem and then just writing into uh, random kernel memory if your kernel is so configured. So that would be a pretty big security risk. Um, in principle, you can think uh, uh, you can think of it like this. In any operation that requires privilege on the host can't be performed inside of a um, unprivileged uh, inside of an unprivileged container, um, because that will usually mean it's something that will either affect the the whole system if this uh, if this is changed if something, for example, like a syscall is changed, or it can be used to attack the host. Both things we want to avoid, but obviously. And a decent container manager will often know when a privileged operation is safe. So sometimes we know that uh, even though this operation requires privilege on the host, we can guarantee as the container manager that this would be safe for the container to perform. Um, two very obvious examples are mounting a block device dedicated to the container. Let's say you have set up a block device, you can vouch that this is not a malicious uh, um, file system image, and you now want to expose this device to the container um, and then mount it inside of the container, mount the file system inside of the container. That's something uh, we would like to do, but we can because of the aforementioned limitations. Or creating harmless device nodes such as dev0, dev0, uh, and so on. So all device nodes that we usually need in order or a container to function correctly. Um, and you can see that this is actually safe because this, the standard practice uh, nowadays is that all these device nodes are just bind mounted in from the host and the container will usually have write and read access to these device nodes. Um, if we wouldn't trust the container with these device nodes, then we wouldn't bind mount them into it. So why there is no uh, obvious reason why the container shouldn't be able to create those device nodes. So one of the things we kept asking ourselves is, can we somewhat elegantly get around these restrictions without, for example, hard coding um, a, a allow list of uh, device nodes in, into the container, which um, wouldn't be an elegant solution. We want something more dynamic. Um, 
this is where syscalls come into play, right? All of these limitations I talked about, so the um, creating device nodes and mounting block devices um, are done via syscalls. So you create device nodes where they might make not or make not add syscall and um, you mount block devices with the mount syscall. Um, and the, the kernel glossing over details um, is essentially a request handler and syscalls are the main requests it recognizes. So. When I'm creating a device node, I'm issuing the make not syscall and I'm asking the kernel, can you please create this device node for me? And the kernel will then on, they'll go on to uh, check that I have the necessary permission to actually create this, uh, uh, create this device node. So this is, uh, this is basically what defines the, the boundary between user space um, and kernel space. Every time we need something, uh, we need something most, something interesting done, we usually transition into into the kernel and ask the kernel to perform an operation for us. So uh, a brief overview because it's important and later on to explain how we emulate and intercept syscalls in user space. Um, you see that I've uh, drawn this uh, boundary right here, user space, and uh, down below is, um, is kernel space. So when user space performs a syscall like if, for example, the make not on the mount syscall, um, then we will transition into kernel space. There is a specific instruction uh, that needs to be triggered, and there is a syscall convention for e that can be different for each individual architecture. And then at some point, the kernel will look up the syscall number in the syscall table, and if it recognizes the syscall number, if it doesn't recognize the syscall, then it will return enosys, which means I'm not recognizing, I don't know what you want from me, this is not a valid system call. Or if it recognizes the system call, it will then go on to actually perform the work that you asked it to do, is asked it to do. And depending on whether or not you have the right permissions or something went wrong, it will report back to you whether or not it was actually successful. Um, performing the syscall and then it will transition back to user space and report uh, either an error code or success or a, a specific return value like for example a file descriptor or some memory um, and um, an interesting aspect of um, how system calls work in the linux kernel at least <clears throat> Um, is SECOMP. Um, SECOMP is uh, short for secure computing, as a lot of people might already be quite familiar with this. Um, and um, what uh, SECOMP does is it allows you to write um, filters uh, for system calls. Um, and you can see it here on the diagram, we will go into this a little bit, that it sits in an interesting uh, position in kernel space, even above the syscall table. Uh, and we will come back to this in a little bit. So SECOMP, as I said, is, is short for secure computing. Um, you can restrict the syscalls, a task is allowed to make. You can also write fine-grained, uh, you can even write more fine-grained filters um, in classic BPF, which is nowadays called CBPF, and it's not to be confused with eBPF, which is extended BPF. Um, and CBPF at least, uh, it's not as powerful, obviously, but it at least allows you to filter on specific arguments and values for those arguments. So you could for example, filter only a specific set of make not syscalls or a specific set of mount syscalls with some restrictions because of the CBPF language. Um, and it's something that is wildly used uh, from um, uh, browsers uh, to data centers. Um, and what, but what SECOMP usually does, it uh, co usually causes this call to be skipped and report an error code, the code to user space. So if we go back to this uh, diagram right here, um, what you will see is when user space um, makes a system call, um, before even the, sy the system call is looked up in the system call table, um, it goes to the SECOMP, it goes to SECOMP, and if there is a, a if a second filter is loaded for the task that performs the syscall and um, the filter actually uh, has uh, is written for this syscall or 
triggers on this given syscall, um, then SecComp gets a say of what, uh, what will happen. So there are multiple options. So either SecComp could completely ignore the syscall and then you uh, enter in the regular system call path we looked at before. So the kernel just performs the system call or um, the kernel, SecComp instructs the kernel to skip the system call. And then SecComp can, for example, fill in an error code or a specific return value to user space um, and then return to user space even before you have um, you, you have actually looked up any, you have even verified that a, that a system call, that the system call you, you try to make uh, actually exists. And so when we think about extending the uh, abilities or capabilities of containers, SECOM seems to be a very natural candidate because it sits, um, it hooks into the system call path. Oh, sorry. Um, already been over the slide. So what we want, and um, why SECOMP and SECOMP is a great candidate for this, is we somehow want to outsource the decisions about whether a system call is allowed to use a space process. Because right now, um, SECOMP, uh, SECOMP filters are relatively static, meaning um, that once a filter is loaded, the kernel will always give you the same action uh, for that system call, for example, return an, an error code. It can't, um, it can't, so to speak, dynamically make a decision, not so to speak, it can't dynamically, we can't dynamically let the kernel decide whether or not a, a specific instance of a system call is allowed. Um, so we want, we really want is, for example, to bring the container manager into the mix so that somehow the container manager instead of the kernel gets to have a say whether or not a system call is going to be successful or not. And um, the way we implemented this is by implementing a new second um, option that can be set on second filters when you load the filter into the kernel. And what it does, it you, you can retrieve a file descriptor for a second filter, which we usually refer to as a notify FD because you get notified on this FD about system calls that the task for which this filter is loaded um, makes. Um, these second notifies can be pulled, so you can put them into a into an event loop and then get notifications about system calls. Um, so a task can actually listen for syscall events on such a second notify FD. Um, there are a few interesting properties and we will look into a few other ones in more detail in a bit. A task can, for example, use an IOCTL to read the system calls from uh, a second notify FD. So it's called a receive IOCTL. So you read the, the extract the data from the kernel, the, um, which includes the system call arguments and so on. Um, a task can also read the memory of the system call, something which the kernel, because of restrictions of the CPPF language, cannot do um, in any depth. In any depth. Um, and the task can then use an IOCTL to instruct the kernel or tell the kernel uh, to, for example, report an error code or success for a given syscall. And in newer kernels, it can even allow the, the kernel or instruct the kernel to continue uh, the system call. Um, so this is the rough, uh, the rough outline of this. Um, what you can do with this, and which is why we're really excited about this feature, is you can use this to emulate syscalls in user space. Um, and it, so you can emulate system calls in user space that would uh, normally, or that would uh, otherwise, uh, that would otherwise fail. Um, and the way this is done is when a container is started up, or how you can do this, is when the container starts up uh, and it loads a second filter, um, the container manager will instruct it uh, to load the second filter with the notify property set, which means that the task will then receive a, a file descriptor for its second filter from the kernel. This file descriptor will then be uh, will then be handed off or can be handed off to the container manager, and the container manager can then place this notify FD into an event loop, um, and depending on what, for example, uh, type of filter you have written, the container manager could then, for example, choose 
to be uh, notified about the make not or the mount syscall, which were, were our two primary examples. Um, and um, so then when the a process inside of the container uh, performs the make not system call, the container manager gets a notification. The task will stay blocked uh, for as long until the container manager had responded to the kernel and instructed the kernel of what actually to do with the system call. And um, then the container manager uh, can, for example, read the system call arguments, um, read the system call memory. If it, for example, wants to look at the paths, a given system call, like the mount system call or the make not system call has been made with. And then um, it can choose to emulate this syscall by, for example, um, creating the device node for the container or mounting the file system for the container because usually the container manager will be a more privileged process or at least suitably privileged process for all of the tasks that you want given a given container to allow. Um, so this is pretty powerful and allows you to get around a lot of the restrictions which we talked about earlier. But one of the problems is that we cannot actually emulate all of the syscalls. So I gave the the prime ex I gave the example of the make not syscall, which we can fully emulate, and um, that is mainly uh, because we can we we can exclude. First of all, make not fails completely in containers, no matter what arguments it gives. And uh, second of all, we can write very fine-grained filters. Um, CBPF language is uh, powerful enough for the make not system call that expresses, for example, I only want to intercept system calls, make not system calls for a specific set of device nodes and only those device nodes I then actually want to emulate. Even if I were to accidentally intercept any uh, make not system call, um, the container manager knows that it would fail anyway and so it doesn't really matter if uh, the system call isn't really isn't really performed the container manager can just instruct the kernel to return eperm but now think about for example the mount system call um, the mount system call has the limitation that all, most of the argu most of the arguments are memory arguments so pointer arguments like source target file system type and data and the problem is that the CBPF uh, program, a CBPF language is not powerful enough to actually um, dereference, uh, dereference in, or as we like to say, chase pointers. So that you can't really instruct a kernel to filter based on the file system type argument um, because the CBPF language is not powerful enough. So that means if I write a if I write a filter um, for the mount syscall, I can filter on the mount flags argument and, for example, make sure that I don't intercept bind mounts um, because I know that the container can already take care of them uh, by itself. Um, but I can't really tell it that I only want to intercept uh, X4 mount system calls. But now imagine I intercept mount system calls. And I also intercept, then that means I also intercept mount system calls when the container, for example, tries to mount the tempfs file system. The problem is that this would usually succeed. The container would be able to mount a tempfs file system um, if correctly set up. Um, but the the problem is we now, the container manager would now need to emulate tempfs uh, mount system calls as well which is totally pointless and also very fragile. Um, you need to get all of the context and security context right in this scenario. So this doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, another limitations are the open or the connect system call. So for example, the open system call usually returns a file descriptor, but obviously if the container manager intercepts the open syscall for a task that is running in the container and then calls open, the file descriptor will be valid in the container manager, but it won't be valid in uh, in the actual uh, a, a process that performed the syscall. So I can't really do anything with open or connect. Um, and as I said, any system call that is accidentally accepted needs to be emulated. So these are severe restrictions that we have to keep in mind. Um, so I want to talk a bit about um, ongoing 
and future work um, in this area. So where we try to get around uh, some of these restrictions that I pointed out in the slide before. So first of all, um, in order to solve the problem where we accidentally intercept system calls that we, that we would then need to emulate for the container, um, we introduced a new property for the second notifier, um, which uh, is, allows the container manager to instruct uh, the kernel to continue a system call after it has intercepted and inspected the arguments. But this is this uh, needs to be something. This needs to be uh, uh, used with a lot of care, because there are, is an inherent talk to in this. Um, uh, uh, there is an inherent talk to. The inherent talk to um, stems from the fact um, when the container manager, when the container actually performs um, a system call and the container manager gets notified and the process in the container is blocked. So the container manager now goes on to uh, inspect all of the arguments of the syscall. So it, for example, reads it from memory and parses it and sees, oh, it wants to create a mount for the X4, uh, X4 file system at this, uh, from the source path I think is fine and from the target path that I think is fine. Um, and uh, then it, were to continue the syscall um, and reasonably privileged, a sensibly privileged attacker um, could then, could in the meantime, write into the memory of the intercepted task and rewrite the system call arguments. So that means when you have two processes in the same, that have the same privilege level and you want to use one process, um, to deprivilege the other process by using the second notifier, that won't work. That is inherently unsafe. So, the second notifier can't be uh, can't be used to uh, um, implement a user space security policy for equally privileged processes. In other words, you always need to be sure that if someone were to rewrite the system call arguments of the system call you're about to emulate, uh, you're about to continue. Uh, then that there are already sufficient restrictions in place that guarantee you that a system call won't be allowed if rewritten to something unsafe or rewritten to a system call with unsafe arguments. And that is usually true for, um, or not usually, this is true for user namespaces because the kernel will ensure that everything, every system call that is unsafe will actually be blocked. But it can be used to implement a user space security policy to be very clear about this. I've also I've written a large, long comment in the second uh, kernel header about this that you can uh, go look up if you're interested in this. Um, in newer kernels, uh, we've implemented a system called PIDFD GetFD, which relates to a different API um, we've implemented over the last years, um, which centers around using file descriptors for, uh, for processes instead of uh, PIDs, uh, but it's, what you only need to know is that you can actually uh, retrieve a file descriptor for another task. So that means if you, for example, intercept um, the, the socket file descriptor or um, the connect file descriptor and you want to, for, uh, you want to, for example, connect the file descriptor of the socket system call for the container to another location in the container originally intended, that you can retrieve the file descriptor, connect, to the address uh, that you want the container to connect um, and then let the container continue on uh, its merry way. So this is pretty, this is a pretty neat mechanism. Um, and we also made it possible with the newer kernels, newest kernels with the 5.9 kernel, actually the released one to inject file descriptors into a different task. So while the task is blocked, waiting uh, for the uh, container manager to tell the kernel to go on, the container manager can with a suitable IOCTL, inject file descriptors into this task. So that means a container manager can open files for uh, the blocked uh, for the blocked task. So when the task calls open on a path, it usually wouldn't be able to open. When the container manager can perform that open, then use that retrieved file descriptor to inject it into the target task. We're also able to replace file descriptors. It's a very powerful um, mechanism. Um, that we have uh, worked on 
um, and that is now uh, available in the kernel. There are a few more, a few other things that we uh, would like to do, but with this set of work that we've done right here, we can emulate the make node system call, we can emulate the mount system call, and with injecting file descriptors and retrieving file descriptors, we are even able to, for example, um, intercept and emulate um, BPF programs, which uh, is pretty neat given how um, important BPF has become um, over the recent years. So I think there was a, a lot of talk and I'm already excited for all the questions you're going to have, um, but maybe we can go on and um, do a little demo. So I need to stop presenting first. Okay, so here's another try on me trying to give this uh, distance demo. I'm sorry for the problems this has caused. Um, so let's launch a new container. And uh, let's also expose a device node to that container. So I'm adding a disk device, a block device to this container. And uh, now, I want to intercept, first of all, the make not syscall. So I'm using Lexi config set F9, security.syscalls.intercept.make, make not. Sorry, true. Lexi restart for uh, F9. And now let's assume I want to create a device node in the container, which would usually totally fail. So let's say I want to create dev zero. Um, C five one five. Ah, and see that worked. The kernel emulated the system. Uh, the container manager emula emulated this is called first. Actually, a character device um, that we now have available inside of the container. But now let's see if we can mount a block device. Let's we have. Um, uh, disk, uh, we have a block device at slash dev SDA, which is an X4 file system. Um, and let's say we want to mount this SDA to slash MNT. And the kernel will not allow us to do this. But with syscall interception, we can tell the container to config, config set um, mount. And then to also allow X4 file system. Uh, we need to restart this to reload, refresh our second filter. And now if I want to mount this file system to slash MT, this worked, see? Now I have it exposed here um, to my container, which is pretty great. You can see there is the mount. Um, there it is. Um, now, some would will obviously point out that this is uh, that this is unsafe. But um, for those, we can say we can also say fuse x4 equals fuse to fs, and mm -hmm. and. If I now start the container and I perform the same mount again, then you will see instead of uh, instead of having mounted it as uh, mounted the real file system, uh, um, Lexd will have rewritten it to use fuse. Uh, and also will have given, given us right access to the directory. So that is pretty, that's a pretty cool um, uh, mechanism. And as I said, we have advanced features available. You can also intercept uh, BPF programs nowadays. Um, and yeah, we're excited uh, about a lot more work coming in, um, in this area and uh, making containers even more usable than they are now. And uh, with that, I'm at the end of my talk. I've even survived a demo. And I'm going to leave the, uh, the failure piece, failure uh, at the beginning in.
I think it's got to be honest, right? Uh, so thanks for attending my talk, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. There will be instructions available how to ask questions. So uh, ask away. Thanks.